On November the 2nd, 1978, I went to Herring Neck. It was the 70th anniversary of the founding of the Fishermen's Protective Union, the FPU, a remarkable organization led by a remarkable man. After checking around, I found the Orange Lodge where that first meeting was held. A lady loaned me an old homemade FPU flag she'd kept tucked away all those years, and the son of one of the fishermen who attended that meeting hoisted it for me over the lodge where it all began exactly 70 years before. A strange little ritual, no crowds, no bands, no cheering. Just the two of us and the tattered old FPU flag flapping in the cold November air and memories of a man and a union that should never be forgotten. William Coker was loved and despised, revered and vilified. To some, he was an agitator, a rogue, a scoundrel, a crook. To others, a great reformer, a patriot, a genius. To the fishermen of our northern bays, he was a fearless leader, a champion of the common man, a kind of northern messiah who led them out of economic bondage. Back in the early days of this century, our fishermen were scattered in a thousand coves. There were no roads, no hospitals, no services, no government assistance. Government was by the rich and for the rich, and a long ways away in St. John's. That's where the big fish merchants were too, the men who took the salt fish and shipped it away. They seemed to live well enough, but there was rarely enough money to ever wipe out the fishermen's debt. Fishermen were shackled to an archaic system of credit and barter. It was a hopeless, soul-destroying existence. Enter William Coker, a man destined to shake the established order and to instill in our fishermen a sense of direction and a feeling of pride and power. As a boy, Coker yaffled fish aboard schooners here in St. John's Harbor. At 13, he organized a strike which increased fish handlers' wages to 40 cents a day. At 16, he articled as a clerk. By the age of 20, he owned a small business but was ruined by the bank crash of 1896. Then he turned to farming on this island in Dildo Run, Notre Dame Bay. We had a job finding it, for Coker's farm is already fading from memory. There's not much to be seen here now. A few stones and slabs of concrete hidden in the grass remains, I suppose, of his house and barn. This large clearing in the forest must have been his farm. Not much to indicate that this was once the home and the dream of William Coker. Cokerville, he called it. Here he labored for years with ax and plow. But this island was also a retreat for William Coker, for while he was farming, he was also thinking, dreaming, planning, and drafting up a constitution of a union which would free Outport Newfoundland once and for all from the yoke of the greedy merchants and the callous politicians. The winter evenings and stormy Sundays gave me the leisure for reading and study, and whatever I worked at, I always found myself drifting away to thoughts of the toiler's life and its hardships, while so many live lives of ease without toiling or producing. On November the 2nd, 1908, Coker was ready. He launched his boat and sailed to Herring Neck. Fishermen gathered at the Orange Lodge to hear this strange hermit farmer speak. I had never addressed a public meeting before that night and was a little nervous about the result. But after speaking five minutes, all doubt had been dispelled and I went on for two hours finding words to put my feelings into expression and did so without effort and without hesitation. There was a packed hall, and after another address of two hours, I asked all who believed in cooperation to remain in order to start an organization. Nineteen remained. 
It must have taken courage, you know, to stand with Coker that night, to join a union, to openly defy the established order. It wasn't long, though, before those 19 herring neck fishermen had company. For young Coker, bursting with enthusiasm, bristling with confidence, traveled on to other outports, rallying fishermen around him, forming new locals of the FPU. His farm was soon forgotten as he moved along the coast, by horse, by boat, by dog team, on foot, rallying fishermen to his union, fanning the fires of discontent which smoldered inside them. The fishermen uh, quietly, and because they, they didn't express themselves, they didn't hold meetings, they, they weren't, there was no protest movement, but quietly each man in his own feeling was disappointed in the price he got for his fish, he was disappointed in the cull of his fish, he had the feeling that the merchants were fleecing him in the price of the supplies, that the fishermen got on credit from the merchant in the way the fish was culled, the fish that was to pay for the supplies, in the price for the fish. Uh, oh, he was being cheated, this was his feeling. Whether he was or not, this was his feeling. He felt that he was being cheated by the merchants. And there was a powerful anti-merchant feeling. And of course, uh, Coker had that to go by. He, th this was a tremendous common denominator between him and the fishermen. Uh, the more he ra raked the merchants, the more he attacked them, the more he exposed them, the more he ridiculed them, the more he slashed them, uh, the more fearless he appeared to the fishermen to be, or he wouldn't be able to do that if he weren't absolutely fearless and independent, and the more to he appealed to them. He was, you might say, in a sense, in a sense, he was appealing to their prejudices. Uh, certainly he was appealing to their emotions. And certainly the appeal that Coker had for them, though it had a certain intellectual content, uh, context, uh, it was primarily emotion. He was appealing to their, their feeling that they were not getting a square deal, their feeling that they were being fleeced, their feeling that that uh, they were being done by unjustly, by the merchants primarily, and by the government, and by the civil servants, and by the doctors, and by everybody in authority, and everybody in any position of affluence. Now, you had almost exactly the same kind of feeling among the farmers uh, across Canada and the United States, because just about the time that Coker's great movement started in Newfoundland, across Canada and in the United States, the Nonpartisan League and the various uh, primary producer movements were being born and built. And, uh, and there was that general feeling up and down this continent that the primary producer, the man who was producing the fish or the wheat or the farm products, uh, was, was getting a rotten deal that if you worked on a merchant's premises, if you were a laborer on the merchant's premises, you didn't have to go out to sea, you didn't have to risk your life. You're working in comfort and some warmth, and you got better paid. Everybody was better paid than the fishermen. Now, this was the universal feeling, and of course it was to that that Coker addressed himself. Whose hard earnings have built up the country? Whose hard earnings have maintained in luxury from year to year the army of bloodsuckers inhabiting this land in the shape of ministers of the crown, civil servants, and government healers? Who? The fishermen! The despised, ill-treated, downtrodden fishermen! The mainstay, bone, and sinew of our island home! I suppose the movement was, was ridiculed at the beginning, was it? Oh, uh, sneered at people before people realized uh, the greatness of the potential. Uh, people just laughed at it, sneered at it. I don't know that the ordinary man, the average man in the street, but the newspapers did. And the merchants meeting in the Board of Trade would meet and, and joke about it. Mm -hmm. They didn't take it too seriously for the first year or so. And then as the word began drifting into St. John's, 
especially from the local, the outport merchants who would be coming into St. John, and they'd say, oh, this could be serious, this, uh, this thing is taking a hold, and you know, this man Coker, is, uh, he's, he's getting to have a very big influence. And when that word would be brought in, uh, here the newspapers and the merchants and the politicians would take it much more seriously. But Lord Morris, Sir Edward Morris, decided in the election of uh, 1913 that uh, this coker stuff was just a big balloon blown up and that he could puncture it with a few needles, he could puncture it. And so he hires a little boat. I don't know whether it was the days he bought some small steamer and he makes a tour down the northeast coast or part of it to go ashore in each place and hold a meeting and explode this coker boom. Explode it, puncture it, put an end to it cause it to collapse. He just escaped with his life. St. John's in those days was filled with vessels, small schooners bringing fish from the outports, and big three-masted foreign-going vessels loading fish for Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, South America, and the West Indies. The waterfront was the hub of the island's economy. Coker realized that the only way to effectively challenge the Water Street merchants was to enter into direct competition. So the Fishermen's Union Trading Company was formed. There wasn't room for the new company here in St. John's, so Coker looked north and Port Union was born. Here on the north side of Trinity Bay, Coker would build a town around the Union store. He would buy fish from Union members, bring in supplies for the fishermen of the northeast coast, ship their fish away to the European markets and challenge the fish merchants at their own game. Port Union has changed over the years, but you can still see the stamp of the Union. The trading company premises, empty now. The houses built for the fishermen and their families who flocked here to work for Coker and the Union. Aaron Bailey, the son of a Labrador skipper man, rose through the ranks to eventually become president of the Fisherman Union Trading Company. He's seen the birth and growth of Port Union. In 1911, when the trading company was formed, they were operating out of St. John's. And the fish operation was on the northeast coast. And they didn't have the facilities in St. John's to, to handle the fish for export. And because that's why they had to get into the way the trading company was formed, because they had to export fish. So uh, Trinity was supposed to be the site we looked at first. Then that was blocked. And this was the only site south of Bonavista Cape for 12 months shipping port. So in 1916, they start the operations here. The plant was start to build here in 1916 so that they could <clears throat> bring in their fish here, store it, package it, and export it throughout the 12 months to the European and South American fish markets. Coker was a man of vision and imagination. The network of ponds and rivers behind Port Union was harnessed much of the work done by fishermen with pick and shovel. The power plant, built in 1916, is still ship-shaped, operating perfectly, supplying the electrical needs of all the surrounding towns. It's startling to realize that this was all functioning here more than 60 years ago, a time when practically all of Newfoundland was lit by lamps. The power helped Coker the inventor too, for from his fertile mind came many schemes and plans to improve and modernize the fishery. Well, the fish operation was the elevators, which was the first elevators in Newfoundland for, for in a fish store. And it's also for the fish presses, which they brought in, which, by the way, was a hay press converted to, uh, to, uh, to electric press for pressing fish in the cask and into the drums. Was this Coker's idea? This was his own idea because he had worked on a Grinchiel's farm outside of Montreal learning sheep raising and they were baling hay there. That's where he got the idea from. I believe he also designed his own fish dryers too. Yes, he had, uh, as back in that period, most of the fish were hung up around the stores with stoves to dry. But Coker uh, designed a dryer with using um, he had a hot air furnace and electric fans, electric blowers, and electric heaters into it. And this was later copied by the Norwegians? This, in 1922, uh, 
to an engineer and the captain of, of uh, ship was here and took the design of the coker dryer down in, in the plant because I was with them at the time when they made it. They also made some recommendations to them for a change, to change it from hot air to steam heating, which he did that year. Uh, that was the first of the starting of the dryer, drying fish in Norway at the time, at, in, at this principle of dryers in Norway. The Fisherman's Advocate is still published in Port Union. Once, it was the most influential newspaper printed in Newfoundland, a powerful vehicle for Coker and the Union, who spread the message throughout the land. It was no mere propaganda sheet either, for it provided complete journalistic services to a group never before tuned in to the outside world, the fishermen. It had other uses too. One old lady claimed her bread wouldn't rise unless it was covered by the Advocate. It was inevitable, I suppose, that Coker would enter politics. Here he is with his union party. Fishermen, or sons of fishermen, boat builders, practical men all, men who knew Outport Newfoundland well, for they were Outport Newfoundland. Originally, at least, they did not want to rule. They wanted to hold the balance of power, to be in a position of neutrality in the House, supporting whichever party that would do the utmost for the masses. The union party swept the North, and proudly marched into the House of Assembly. It was a remarkable moment in our history. It must have been a dramatic scene in the old colonial building when Coker and, and his party moved into the House. Yes, of course, they had, he had formed a coalition with Sir Robert Bond, the uh, leader of the Liberal Party. And so the, the party was known as the Liberal-Union Party, the Liberal Union party. And uh, actually, uh, Coker got more men, union candidates elected, than Bond got liberal candidates elected. Of course, in the districts where the union candidates were elected, uh, they, there would have been liberal candidates elected if the candidates had been liberals and not union candidates. But uh, Coker outnumbered the liberals. And Bond was, I think, a little disgusted. Bond was always a little bit suspicious about making the deal with Coker in the first place. Uh, Co uh, Bond had his suspicions of the, of the soundness and the propriety of Coker and Coker's movement and Coker's FBU. Nevertheless, he did form a coalition with him. So when Coker went in the House of Assembly, he went in there knowing more, perhaps, about uh, the, the affairs around the island, around the country, than any member of the House knew. And the enormous fun he would have when the uh, estimates came before the House, the estimates of the proposed expenditure for the coming year. Uh, he says, hey, $50 this for the, this is one of the old Tory uh, 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 healers, one of the healers. Now you're going to pay him off, huh? You're going to pay him off out of public funds. And he could name every single individual vote. In the, it was astonishing, the, the knowledge he had of the places and the things and the people and the individuals of the whole northeast coast. Uh, I think he could have called thousands of fishermen by their first name, and he would know who the shopkeepers were and the merchants and all that, and uh, he took diabolical pleasure in exposing what never would have been exposed in the House of Assembly when the estimates were brought down. Coker pushed for legislation to improve the lot of sealers and loggers, but his main thrust was toward improving and developing the salt cod fishery. This was the lifeblood of Newfoundland, and always would be. He called for strict government control of marketing, and when he finally became Minister of Fisheries, piloted through his new regulations. He met stiff opposition from some of the fish exporters. What was going wrong was that our merchants who were our exporters, you see, a merchant then was a man who outfitted a fisherman on credit, took his fish in to pay for the supplies, then packed the fish, exported the fish to the various markets. That's what a, a fish merchant was. He was an exporter. And they had no system for export. They dumped it. They dumped it. First of all, it was all on consignment. Every kettle of fish that left Newfoundland to Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Malta, the West Indies, Brazil, no matter where, every kettle that went, went unsold. 
It went on consignment. It would land in Oporto, in Lisbon, and anywhere in Naples, in Piraeus. It would land unsold. Well, now, if you were an importer in those countries, and cargo after cargo after cargo of salt cod was arriving from Newfoundland, and in the harbor there were two or three or four schooners loaded with fish, a semi-perishable article of food, what did you do? Did you rush out to buy it? and keep the price up and keep the price firm. No, you took your time, you waited, and you got the price down. You got it down, you got it down, and then you bought it. Well, the result of that was that never in any year did enough money come back into Newfoundland to, uh, you know, to, 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 to enable Newfoundland to live, to give the fishermen a decent living, to give the merchants a decent profit. There just wasn't enough money coming back for the fish that went out because of the appallingly inefficient system of cutthroat competition among the merchants themselves to dump their fish on the markets. And that, that was the heart of the whole thing. And until Coker discovered that, and he did discover it by visiting the markets, he was, I think, the first uh, person in the world from Newfoundland to visit all the markets and see what was happening in each individual market. He was a master of it. He, uh, he, he really knew, you see. And then he discovered that where he'd been attacking the merchants, he'd been attacking them for the wrong thing. He'd been attacking them for being devils. It was the devil theory. Every merchant was a devil, robbing the fishermen. Now he discovered that every merchant was himself the victim of a system which was a, a, a terrible system. And so he ended up his career fighting to get a decent marketing system for salt cod. Remember then, at the peak, the amount of salt cod was two million, two million kentles in one year. Two million kentles. And, and that was all that Newfoundland had, more or less. That's what she had to try to live on. You had a paper mill, and after a while you got a second paper mill you had Bell Island, but primarily Newfoundland was trying to live on the money that came back from the markets for the salt cod we shipped out. Now his regulations were designed to improve that marketing system and eventually they Not failed. to improve, it, but, but to wipe out cutthroat competition, to wipe out consignment shipping, and to see that all fish would not leave Newfoundland until it was sold. It had to be sold before it was shipped, and it had to be sold at a price fixed before it left. Well, why did the regulations fail? Well, number one, the Portuguese importers and the Portuguese government fought like tigers against it. So did the Spanish, so did the Italian, the Consorcio and the Gremio, the different governmental organizations that were set up to fight it and to resist it. And so did some of our local merchants, some of the biggest of them fought it. The biggest of them all supported the fish regulations, but two or three of the biggest fought it and it ended up in court, and the thing had to be dropped. Some say they were introduced at the wrong time and in too high-handed a manner. Some say it was simply blind hatred of Coker and everything he did, that the regulations were sabotaged from the beginning. Whatever the reason, the regulations failed. There was panic, a rush to the markets. The price of fish collapsed, money was lost, and many placed the blame on Coker and his regulations. But as the years progressed and our fishery began to stagnate, other fishing nations surged ahead with state-controlled marketing schemes not unlike those which Coker had envisioned, a bitter pill. Was he a bit disillusioned in his later years when he saw our fishery start to fade and, and the Norwegians and the Icelanders uh, catching up and passing us? Well, I remember one thing that struck me very vividly in my visit to the European markets with him in 22 was this, we were in Greece. And that was the first year that the Icelandic people were putting wet salt of fish, medium wet salt of fish in. And he said to me, look, if we don't change in Newfoundland, they're going to take the market from us with this type of processing of fish. Yeah. And he said, this is, they're coming in there, and of course this is what has happened over the years. Now, was this what his regulations were designed to overcome? It was designed for to give to the markets what they wanted and control the shipments. That was the main thing, so they wouldn't cut the price in the market, see? Well, now, if Coker's uh, ideas had been really carried through, uh, what would it have meant to the Newfoundland fishery eventually? Well, you would have had a much 
orderly, organized industry, as the Norwegians and the other people have done through the years. Uh, I don't think it would, his idea was the government shouldn't control it, hmm? but there should be marketing organizations. And the marketing organizations could be controlled by the, the trade themselves, hmm? with the fishermen and the, and the government agent. Do you think it was a man ahead of his time? His ideas were just too, too revolutionary for Oh, him? yes. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Because all the things that Coker advocated, we had them today, we take them all for granted. And so there lived a man, William Coker, a man ahead of his time, a man with a vision, with a cause, a man determined to improve the lot of the fishermen of Newfoundland. Myths and rumors have grown about Coker. His historic image is clouded, confused. This, I suppose, is understandable, for he was a controversial figure, a zealot who roused hatred and resentment as he did love and respect. He challenged all who stood in his way. He upset the established order. Business, church, and state shuddered under this man, Coker. This man who stirred the northern fishermen, who molded them into a union and a political force. They're all gone too now, the 19 fishermen who stood with Coker that night 70 years ago in the lodge at Herring Neck. Little did they know they would go down in history as the nucleus of the FPU, a remarkable movement that would spread throughout northern Newfoundland like wildfire, a union that would change the face of this island. The FPU has faded and died, but in its time it was a force to be reckoned with. And so was its leader, William F. Coker. <laughs>